It's our first in this series called Zooming Out. I keep saying Zooming In because that's what we did last year. So we're Zooming Out this year. It's a global series, which I think is going to be a lot of fun. I've been interacting with a lot of global grads lately, and I thought it'd be a great way to showcase them. Um, we have six different grads that we'll be featuring through December. Um, one is an LLM grad, so excited about that. And then we have um, five other people from around the globe, Australia, Hong Kong, Paris, Lyon. And we have Maya, who's first up. She agreed to be uh, the first in a line of illustrious grads. And I'm so excited to talk with Maya today. Maya is class of 1996. Hi, Ooh, Maya. Yes. Hi, just hearing that number is a little daunting, but hello. Yeah, so I wanted to read a little bit about Maya's background, then we're going to talk a little bit about travel, which will be fun. I'm traveling vicariously through a lot of these graduates um, because I'm not doing any international travel right now. So this is part of the fun, part of the engaging part is hearing about where they live. Um, Maya is, as I said, class of 1996. She's in Amsterdam. She's a senior privacy counsel. Um, she's an IP attorney. She's licensed in New York. She does a lot of transactional work. Her work as a data privacy counsel spans various sectors from the health industry to business, travel, digital marketing, e-commerce. She handles agreements related to data privacy, processing personal data, marketing campaigns, inter internal privacy practices, data classification for clients, colleagues, and other attorneys. She began her career as an IP attorney focusing primarily on copyright matters, advising companies and creators on protecting and maximizing assets. She has great familiarity with US trademark law. Since 2018, Maya has been living and working in Amsterdam, the Netherlands, first as a data privacy subject matter expert for one of the big consulting firms. She's still there as a senior privacy counsel and regional director for a privately held multinational corporation. Before attending law school, Maya was a broadcast journalist for radio and television, uh, news organizations in California, Texas, and New York. And um, I know Maya quite well because she was a regional chapter chair for um, over a decade for me in New York City. So I got to know her well through that. She also served one time as a woman in the law conference co-chair, did an exceptional job. So Maya and I have a lot of history. You see some of her CV facts here on the screen and uh, some of the ways that I know her. She also went to the Fame High School. She has a real background and an appreciation for the arts. And I think we'll see some of that when we look at her photos. Let's dive in a little bit to the photos. And this yeah. is kind of where I get to just travel and have fun with Maya. Talk about some of what's happening here. It looks like it's a real biking town. First of all, I'm gonna say that. It, absolutely. Um, it is a biking city, probably one of the best in the world for biking. Um, and uh, the picture of me, which I had to run around and get some tourists to take of me because I have very few pictures of myself, um, is my little beat up secondhand bike. Um, and I'm on one of the, the bridges in Amsterdam. Um, behind me, the building, you can see all that white surrounded by red brick, is um, the National Opera and Ballet House. And for me, that was um, a critical place to have somewhere because um, the ballet is one of my absolute passions. And um, nine months in uh, living in Amsterdam, when I went to the first ballet, my first ballet performance here, um, I sort of exhaled and I thought, yes, I can live here. There's a real ballet company with, you know, excellent uh, performers, et cetera. So that's what this is. And you'll see, um, you know, canal boats and other things behind. Um, this bridge actually goes over the Amstel River, which is the river uh, for which the city of Amsterdam is named. Um, and uh, so that's, it's not a canal. The other two photos here with water are canals and okay. um, Amsterdam is known as, as uh, a massive canal cities and they're everywhere. Um, and one of the, the things I really have come to appreciate 
um, living here is really what masters the Dutch are in handling water. Um, I still don't truly understand how dikes work um, and locks and everything else, but these are the masters. And so there's water everywhere that was essentially, the city was you know, created by channeling this water wherever they needed it to go. So we can go to other folk, the other pictures. Okay, now. wow, that, yeah, that's beautiful. The one in the lower left, beautiful. Yeah, yeah, that's a block away from me. Um, more water, this is uh, not, not man-made, this is ocean. Um, wow. This is a walk on the beach, um, roughly a little less than an hour away from Amsterdam. Actually, it's a lot less than an hour away um, by car. This was uh, January 2nd. Um, one of my local friends um, said, let's go take a walk on the beach. It's a tradition here for people to go on New Year's Day, like the polar bear swim that we all know about. Yes. Uh, people do that here, but this is the North Sea. This is a little different. Right? It's like cold. Uh, did not do that, but we did witness um, someone who, you know, dove in and then was doing all sorts of, you know, push-ups and whatnot on the beach um, in his birthday suit. Um, so that was, you know, <laughs> yeah. But this was just me walking along the beach all bundled up on a beautiful day, um, January 2nd. That's great. It's nice to know the beach is so close to you. I didn't, I wasn't thinking that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the one of those is also that same day on the beach. Uh, I was walking in a place where there are dunes and it was just beautiful because we were walking on these sand dunes and on the one hand was the ocean and on the other hand, um, we could actually see um, elk walking around. It was really wow. you know, extraordinary, yeah. Um, the other picture uh, is uh, of one of the restaurants along the Amstel River um i went last summer and luckily there was a covering um because there was an immense rainstorm um as i sat there to have a cocktail and and whatnot and then it typical amsterdam it cleared up and you can see the the clouds and the sun behind and that was just you know like a lovely setting so gorgeous is it like new england where they say if you wait five minutes the weather will change <laughs> Yes, except okay. it's pouring rain one minute um, and then the sun comes out and you never knew it was raining and then it'll happen again and that can happen about five times in a day. So it's, does, you know, it, have to have four, does it have four seasons? Um, yes, <laughs> except that I define summer a little bit differently. So it rarely gets hot here okay so um with the exception of maybe four days in august the temperature was like in the 60s oh, wow. you know and cool so um that's you know dutch summer okay um yeah so there are four seasons but but not ah this was really uh kind of fun so the this is the gay pride parade last year or actually not last year the year before 2019 the okay. last time it was held and what was, I, you know, I've attended, you know, the Pride Parade in New York, which is in June, but in every city, it's different news to me. Yeah. And what's very cool about Amsterdam, several things. One is the parade is on one of the canals, right? So all of the floats and everything is actually on the water. Right. <laughs> um, and I happened to have friends who had a an apartment right on the Plinsenklacht where this happened. So great view, hordes of people. And it, it, it's really like a fun family festival event. Everybody participates, kids, etc. Um, yeah. So lots of fun. And um, what I want to just point out is that so when there are any big events, there are these banners that the city puts up all over, and those banners are banners, you know, for Pride Week that went up like a week or two before Pride Week and throughout and and so forth. And the second one, I remember just looking at this um, in 2019, the Black Lives Matter, okay? We're talking before 2020, before George Floyd, but that was one of the things that was up and part of um, Gay wow. Pride Week. So, Fantastic, yeah. and I love the genders, we do them all. Yes, <laughs> yes. Love that. So, yeah, 
Yeah. I mean, I've uh, always it's... thought of Amsterdam as a very open city. I did go there once, yeah. but I, you know, it's very welcoming and. Yes, um, it is. And, and I think it just kind of speaks to the fact that yes, it is, um, you know, very open and, you know, tolerant um, all around. So we can see what else is, is there. What's next? And then get married. Oh. Uh, so uh, <laughs> can't get away from uh, the Netherlands uh, without talking about flowers. And yes, these are real. Um, this wow. is uh, an area near Amsterdam uh, where they they grow tulips. Um, you know, they grow tulips everywhere. There are other flowers in the Netherlands, but obviously this is sort of the stereotype. And um, I went to this area, Kuchenhof, um in 2019. So my first spring here and just heard that this was a place to go see tulips. And I managed to, you know, have some very kind uh, Dutch person take me out here, not knowing that this was the most touristed area for seeing tulips and we went on the most touristy weekend um so that was a very kind soul who took me there um and it's just amazing to see these rows and rows and rows of um tulips and we can go to the next one this is gorgeous this looks like washington dc to me Yes, well, it's not Washington DC, um, but it is, so the, the spring blossoms, which is exactly what they are, um, the cherry tree blossoms, it's in an area um, of what they call a forest, Amsterdam Sabosch, which is actually a man-made forest. Um, so again, the Dutch just like, okay, we need to create land. <laughs> And my understanding, I, I don't have this factually, but the stories I've heard is that this forest was created as a way to um, bring jobs um, after World War II. And wow. so it was, you know, clearing out stuff and planting trees. And within this um, forest, uh, there's a, a um, cherry blossom area. And I went there in April of 2020, which if you can think back that far, you know, yeah. the lockdowns had just begun everywhere. And, and um, going here was the first time I saw the signs in Dutch, you know, stay uh, 1.5 meters apart and so forth. And everybody was very respectful, um, but it was just beautiful. And um, it is beautiful. really enjoyed that. By the way, that, that previous picture, looking at the rows of tulips, the, that picture, yeah, yeah. The next photo that's the singular tulip, that's it one was? of those. Oh, wow. So that's even not the, touched up. That's not Even anything. the cows that's, are pretty in Amsterdam. No. <laughs> so that singular, tulip, I mean, I look at that photo and I think this looks like a touch up. It's not touched up. I just got close to one of these tulips, took that photo with my, you know, little ancient phone and it's just, it's gorgeous. Um, the white cows was just kind of crazy. I went for a hike uh, with one of my friends and you know we were seeing all this heather everywhere and I'd never seen white cows. So I thought this was really peculiar and interesting and, and kind of fun. Um, beautiful, beautiful, the heather's gorgeous. Yeah, yeah. So what else? Ah, okay. You can't talk about the Netherlands and Amsterdam without talking about the Dutch masters. And this is Johannes Vermeer, whom I really, really appreciate. Um, most people think of um, the girl with, you know, the earring, the pearl or whatever. And I, I actually love these two, maybe because I'm particular to landscapes. And um, the one is um, View from Delft, um, which is, you know, another city in the Netherlands. And I went to this, the museum where this is kept. And you can tell where the girl with the, the earring was because there are hordes of people around trying yeah. to look at this little painting. And I just looked over and that took my breath away. Um, I just thought it was gorgeous. And I subsequently visited Delft and was trying to figure out exactly, you know, oh. what Vermeer was seeing at the time. And the other one is a very small painting that I also love. Um, it almost looks like a photograph. Um, and that one is actually at the Rijks Museum. Um, and it's, I, I just, you know, these are two of my favorites. I think if I have to choose um, a Dutch artist, I really love Van Gogh, or as they say properly, Van Gogh. 
but um I just thought, you know, yeah, yeah, it's the h sound, which is. Uh, Those are gorgeous. Have you been, or do they have a ton of museums? And are you, you yeah. know, taking yeah. part of your weekends to explore those kinds of things? And uh, yes, not as much as I would like to, and, and as I can. Um, yeah. But yes, and um, it's a real treat. There is. Um, there is a lot of culture in the Netherlands and I picked these two very classic, very traditional um, paintings by a known Dutch master, but there's all kinds of stuff here, including a street art um, museum that I wanna you know, uh, partake in, I haven't yet. Um, and one of the things that speaks to sort of the quality of life here is um, there's something called a museum card. So it's basically, you, pay a, a fee, in my opinion, nominal uh, per year. And that gives you admission or reduced admission to over 400 museums in the country, um, wow. which is kind of amazing. Um, so well yeah, yeah. Um, so, okay. And I think, do we have more? Yes. Okay. So um, the outdoor picture is my roof deck um wow. which when the weather's nice i can appreciate and, and oh, enjoy nice. um it's and they're into solar um yes yes indeed so i live in an apartment that's in a house built in 16 some odd um it's it's kind of crazy and it's been you know renovated that's not a picture of my house by the way um the the picture was just i saw these flowers and i thought they were absolutely beautiful and yes the dutch are very much into flowers and i picked up the habit their flowers i had at some point you know in my apartment and just you know my table your, roof, your rooftop yeah no, it's not on my roof um i'm working on developing gardening skills. I'm not quite there yet, but that plant I'm very proud of because it's one of the rare plants that I, um, you know, have been able to keep alive, let's put it that way. And that's that's a new uh, phenomenon. New yeah, so I think that's, that's it. That's beautiful, yeah. And I love the wisteria. So I'm so appreciative of you taking us on a little tour of your new town yeah. and telling us a little bit about Amsterdam so we can just enjoy sure. that vicariously a little bit. Um, next up, we are going to dive into your work life a little bit and how you transitioned over to Amsterdam and kind of what some of your takeaways are for someone that might be considering um, making a move or just to learn a little bit about it. But first off, tell me what drew you to Amsterdam and Europe in general without getting too political because I do know you. Um, but <laughs> tell me I'll, what drew you. I'll keep it for all audiences. Um, okay. So I, I'll answer the, the second part of that question first. Uh, what drew me to Europe? And um, I've always been interested in, in Europe. Um, I visited for the first time, you know, as a child bef before my teens and then and, and throughout and came often as a tourist. And I was just always very um, interested in, in the, the lifestyle, the perspectives as I perceived them. And it was this sort of fantasy to, you know, live here and um, never made that happen for a variety of reasons. You know, life got in the way and then became a lawyer, which, you know, limits your can, not necessarily does, your, your um, uh, mobility in that sense. Um, but I saw an opportunity and I thought, you know, if not now, when? Um, so I started really exploring where I would find the most opportunities. Um, and so that's how I, I came upon Amsterdam. I mean, my, you know, charming, lovely dream cities were always Paris and Berlin and two cities that I still love. Um, but as somebody who has to support herself and figure out how to work and wants to work, um, Amsterdam really had the most possibility for opportunities. Um, because it is um, very much a mecca for multinational corporations. Um, they all have a European presence here. And part of my value proposition, I really need to work where there are multinationals. So um, yeah. that's why Amsterdam, Got it. um, it's, it's actually been a good choice. It, it's been a good choice for me for many reasons. 
Um, and those of you who know me uh, know that I'm a diehard New Yorker. And, um, you know, fun fact, as most people should know or may know, uh, New York was originally New Amsterdam. Um, the Dutch were the first to the first Europeans to settle um, uh, the area we now know as New York. And although they weren't there for very long, they definitely left an imprint. Um, and so there's a familiarity um, about it. You know, the, the Dutch um, have a reputation amongst Europeans as being sort of rude and to the point and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, oh, just like New Yorkers that, you know, fit right in. And, um, you know, the, the, they're also amazing merchants, right? That's what got them, you know, to go over in the first place and, you know, everywhere, but, but to settle in uh, New Amsterdam and New, that's what New York you know is also known for commerce and trade and making money so so there there's a certain odd familiarity even though it's not a country that i have another you know like a familial or any affiliation to but there's something about the attitude and and the perspective um in in some respects that is uh, familiar what about like day-to-day -day lawyering it, would you say it's similar to working in the united states is the work ethic different? Is your pace different? Do you like, you know, New Yorkers are always known to start at 10 a.m. and go to 10 p.m. You know, they're late starters, late workers. Is it is it similar to that? Or tell us a little bit about is the quality of life better, different than New York? Um, it's, it's definitely different. Um, in my opinion, the quality of life is better, period. Um, but there's the quality of life and then there's work life, right? And, and um, I, I think the easiest way to describe the difference, I'm not saying that one is better than the other. Quality of life is one thing. Working, you know, is another. Um, not only the Dutch, but in, in, from what I can tell and from friends elsewhere on the continent, also friends that I had in New York who were from, you know, Europe and, and other places. It's really people work so that they can live. They don't live for work. It's, it's a different perspective. Yeah, life is important. Having a life is important. Um, and it's not just something that is talked about. You know, it, it's kind of for real. Now, that's not to say that people don't work hard and it's not to say that um, it, the expectations are different. Let's put it that way. And, and it's taken seriously. And when people are on vacation, they're on vacation. Um, you know, weekends are weekends. People are expected to have, you know, a life. And a, I, I will say that family and family life is really, really big here. And, and honestly, it's, I think it's big everywhere. Um, I'm the exception in that I, you know, come from a city where everything and anything goes and, you know, I think of New York as, you know, the home of all the weirdos in the world, right? So, you know, family is not um, um, as big a part of people's lives in New York City necessarily as um, in other places, but family is a big deal here. Yeah. Um, but definitely, um, now I don't work in private practice. I work for a corporation. Um, so it's, it's different. I mean, in, in, I do have friends here that work in law firms and, and they work longer hours. I don't think it's the hundred hours that, you know, uh, sometimes people put on timesheets at law firms, right? Um, and right. there is still pressure, but I, I, it, it's different, yeah. Tell yeah. me about some of your privacy work, some of the projects you've worked on and that you're excited about. And is it, are they different from what you worked on when you were doing it in New York? Tell me about some of your projects, um, if you can, if they're not private. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I think one of the, the biggest differences, um, just in terms of my work and, and what I do is, um, it, it's really perspective. So privacy work is privacy work, but you're talking about laws and laws that apply in one place, but don't in another. And um, so the work I do is different only to the extent of the clients that I'm serving. Um, when I was in New York, I had my own practice. And so I was by and large um, an outside um, 
consultant or I, I, I had private practice clients. I semi seconded to various companies. Um, now I work for a company. So I have a client within my company. Right. And um, so, but, but that has nothing to do with privacy per se. That just has to do with the, the practice area. Um, in terms of the differences in privacy, again, the laws are different, right? Um, and um, the thing that I think is the most um, challenging to convey is um, there's a general notion that, well, there's no privacy in the U.S. And, and that's not the case. Um, there are actually more privacy laws in the U.S. than, than probably anywhere else because they are sector based. There is not one overarching, overriding privacy law that you look to to go to and say there are all your answers. That's not what happens. What sector are you in? What state are you in? What federal laws apply? So there's a myriad of sector based laws in the U.S. So that's one thing. Um, and um, in the U.S., the, the, there's a different perspective, and it, it has to do with, with the legal systems. Uh, the U.S. is a common law system. Um, most territories in, in the EU are civil code, so it, it works differently. You look, this is what the law says, that's what you do, and that's what you follow. And, and there tends to be a more conservative attitude and to just you know, this is what it says, this is what you have to do. Um, and I think the attitude in the States of more, it's like, okay, well, that's what it says, but you know, how can we work with this, right? What, how can we make this happen? How can we test this, right? Um, so it's, it's a little bit more of the, you know, the getting creative, seeing how you can make things happen within the boundaries of the law, which are sometimes flexible. Right. right, it's a different perspective here. In terms of projects, um, you know, I don't know if anybody on, in the privacy world is, is um, you know, online, but um, one of the biggest things to um, happen in the privacy space uh, or since last July was um, this um, decision by the European Court of Justice, um, which uh, has made the transfer of personal data across boundaries that much more challenging. Um, and so I've been uh, working on that almost continuously for a year and all of the repercussions of that. Um, it's really interesting and part of what I think makes this area of the law interesting for me and is the fact that it's, it's not static and stayed and there it is and you look it up and there's the answer it's constantly evolving and changing and there are challenges which is what makes it interesting challenges also can be frustrating and you know trying to find the right solution and trying to um, persuade the powers that be all over from you know the people who have the money to make things happen to the clients who ask for things that are not really possible um, to, to figure out how to bring all of that um, together. So I have um, kind of related next question to um, yeah. what do you wish you knew before you went overseas to work? What, what have you found out that you wish you knew before you got there? Or did you have to just experience it and kind of trial and error and find out? I think a lot of it you have to experience, you know, I, I don't think necessarily with this move for me that had I known I would have done things differently or I wouldn't have come. Um, that's not the case, but it's often the case that if you knew all of the things you might not, you know, do it. Um, I think the, the biggest surprise, there were two unexpected things. Um, well, three, one was it took me a lot longer to get acclimated than I anticipated. Um, and that probably just has to do with the fact that I'm not 20, surprise. Um, and so, you know, I'm not quite as, you know, I, I established and I have my doctor and I have, you know, and, and so, you know, as, as you um, are a little more um, mature in your life, 
you know, picking that up and, and changing it. And I am flexible and I have no reason in the world not to do this. But so it just took me longer than I anticipated. Maybe, um, maybe a little naive. Um, the second thing, and this is ridiculous, and I know it's ridiculous, but here it is. Um, I know that Dutch is the language of the Netherlands and that's what people speak. I knew that. I know that I don't speak Dutch, but, but the sort of anxiety, every time I get another bill, another letter, everything, of course, is in Dutch. It should be. That's the language. But, but that's one of those silly little things that as a person who's used to doing everything and being relatively high functioning, suddenly you get a letter, you know, from the government and you're like, oh, what is it say? Right. <laughs> right? And what, ha what happened? And what is this? So that, or it doesn't even have to be that intense you, you know go to the grocery store and you know you're trying to figure out is this detergent or is this you know softener or what is this or reading instructions you know so that the the importance when you're living somewhere and look I traveled a lot before I moved and yeah. I'd always figured out you know how to communicate with people and that's great when you're figuring out communication or getting direct directions or ordering food or whatever, but when you are living life and have to do all of your little errands, um, right? It, it, it's, it's a thing. So, um, are you it picking wasn't up some Dutch? Is that impossible? It's a challenging language. Um, I, I speak Spanish. Um, I studied French. I can you know, fake Italian and Portuguese, and I can make myself, Dutch doesn't have a root with any of those. So it's, it's challenging. Um, I will learn um, because I want to, and I think that as a courtesy to the country, you know, where I'm um, a, sort of a guest, um, I, I need to, and I, you know, it, it's part of truly really acclimating. Um, the, the other thing that was really surprising um, and took a long time to figure out was the banking system. And again, that sounds so basic and silly. Um, Do I have it, any money? <laughs> it's, it, well, you know, it's, it's a different system and frankly, it's more efficient. However, it it's really takes some getting used to. So there are no checks right? Checks do not exist, paper checks. And so everything is um, the equivalent of what we think of as a wire transfer, right? So I have my personal account and I just, you know, give you my personal account information and you deposit money there. And the idea of giving someone like your routing number, essentially your account number, is like, who am I giving this to it? You know, but, but that, that's just how everything is done. So, um, it's, it's just interesting because I was expecting to have like checks when I opened my personal account, but they don't exist, nor can I deposit a check from the US. Like that just doesn't happen. Um, the other thing related to that, and again, it's more efficient, but it takes some getting used to is that the vast majority of, of your bills um, your internet, your phone, your utilities, um, what else? Gym memberships are all automatically deducted from your account, okay. which also freaks me out. Um, you know, I want to generate when I make the payment. <laughs> Don't you come and get it out of my account, but that's, that's the that way works. it is. So did that it, did any of your co-ops, were they overseas? No, actually, no. they were not. Yeah, yeah. Do you um, think I did all. Mm -hmm. Is your long term plan to continue to work there? Um, I, my short term plan doesn't involve going anywhere else. So I guess by default, yes, I, I'm enjoying it here. Um, yeah. I think there's a really good um, quality of life here. Um, and I am in the habit of not using ever and never in my vocabulary. So I have no idea what 
the future will bring. So I don't want to say I'm never going back or I'm staying here forever. I have no idea. I know that right now um, I'm enjoying this. Um, I like it here. I am determined to learn Dutch um, just because <laughs> I'm stubborn. And um, so I have no doubt yeah, you had I, a, a grad in the chat say she would help you. One of uh, the grads that I know quite well, Juliana Spofford, who is Dutch. Okay. Um, has offered cool. to help you with anything. In a minute, okay. we're going to open it up for questions. So we'll let you guys communicate then. But what else, okay. Maya? Is there anything else people should know before they pick up, move countries, think about moving overseas? Do you have any like final tidbits of advice that you want to share or you think we should all know? Sure. So I, I think, you know, this is not for the, the faint of heart, right? Um, so if if you're looking to make you know a move let me back up by saying i had moved cross country a couple of times right in when i was living in the states and i lived in various states and i went to law school in boston and i did all of my co-ops outside of boston so moving and relocating was not a new thing for me moving to another country is different Right, yeah. so I can pack up boxes, but, but this is not about packing up boxes and finding a place to live. There, there's much more to it. So to do it, I just think you really have to know why, um, why you want to make the move. And I think what you wanna get out of it, right? Um, so are you just looking to have an experience? Um, are you looking for a particular type of job? You know, I, like what are your, main reasons for wanting this um, and then what are your priorities right because different places work for different people um, and for me for example i'm a city person there's no doubt about it um, and i needed to be in a city um, and and what that means for me so as i said when i went to you know, the ballet and it wasn't the first piece they did, but the second piece that was like, oh, okay, this is like, real. I can live here. This, this speaks to me and this is important to me. Um, there are several, you know, concert halls and there's a, an entire um, community of really offbeat experimental music. Um, I've had several friends and former clients that, that represented um, musicians at one point in time who've played here while I've been living here. So it, it, that is here, the arts, and um, it's easy to get into nature. I mean, that man-made forest that I was telling you about, you know, I ride Beautiful. my bike there. Um, there are a variety of parks. There's a lot of, um, sea, of waterfowl here, which really surprised me. All kinds of birds I've never seen before and I don't know what they are, but they're really cool and they're everywhere that that mix of things that that um the culture that's important to me and the fact that it is diverse so yeah. there is a fairly large um expat and international community here um another thing that um tipped the scales for me with amsterdam is that there really is an infrastructure here for expats it is kind of amazing um sure. and so that even though i had a difficult time you know not difficult it took me longer to acclimate and i still have you know whatever to, to the, the infrastructure set up um for expats and for me that was important um important. Helpful. or at least i knew it was here and that i could avail myself of it and when i looked for similar situations in some of the other cities i was looking at i was like okay this is not set up at all for you know people like me um so i think knowing why you want to do it um what's important to you um and then i'd say you know really do some serious research what kind of work do you want to do Right. And, and if you want to do legal work, what is the legal system? How, you know, if you're going to be working as a lawyer, can you work as a lawyer in your place of destination? And where would that be? Um, I moved here in 2018, um, but I, in November of 2016, thought this is the time for me to move, it, you know, and, and the, GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation, was coming into force, and then blah, 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 blah. And I thought, I, 
I need to figure this out. And I first spent a month looking at different cities. I know you and talked then about that for a while. Yeah, and um, when I finally was clear that Amsterdam was the place, then I was relentless about trying to figure out how to get here. Um, and I, so I worked on this for about two years um, right. and, and took a chance and, you know, took an opportunity. I came to work as a consultant, not as a lawyer. And, and that was hard because I identify as a lawyer and that's what I do. And I'm a good transactional lawyer and I enjoy doing that. But I came to be a privacy consultant. And I did that for um, a little over a year and managed to parlay that into an in-house counsel position where I am drafting and negotiating, you know, ad nauseum basically, and, and doing a whole lot of other things um, as a privacy lawyer. So it's, it's really getting clear what you want, where that is available um, and what you're willing to do to get it. To get, to get there. Well, that's maybe a place for us to stop, but I've loved traveling with you today. Learning about your city, <laughs> getting to just see you is fantastic. Yeah. I'd love to open it up. If other people have comments or questions, you can unmute Before yourself. you do, I yeah. just want to give a big shout out to the classmates that I've seen okay. uh, on here. Thanks, you guys, for joining. Um, Dennis and Sylvia, and I saw Dina there. Hey, Dina. So it's really, it's, thank you guys. It's great to see you. And I've had, you know, people reach out. So this is very exciting. Okay, now everybody can ask whatever they want. <laughs> yeah, if you, if you wanna, un can you unmute yourself? Sometimes you can't in these. If you wanna ask a question, we'd love to hear it from you. Sylvia, can you? Sure. Yeah, hi, Maya. Good hi. To see you. <laughs> yeah, good to um, see you. So how, how are you there? Like, are you there on a work visa? Or yeah. how did you do that? That's, that's a good question. So I am here on what's called a highly skilled immigrant visa, um, which is the equivalent of I'm sponsored, essentially. Um, so it's tied to my employment. Um, and that was the most expedient way for me to be able to, you know, come here. Um, truth be told one of the reasons I want to learn Dutch is because after I'm here for five years, if I pass a certain proficiency exam, et cetera, then I can, I'm entitled to um, permanent residency, which would then allow me to stay irrespective of my employer. Of course, I still have to work and I still have to make money, right? But, but it wouldn't necessarily be tied to my work um, but yeah, that's, that's how I'm here. It's called a highly skilled immigrant visa. Um, and there are various other ways, but this was the, the most, um, straightforward. Um, we have a question in the chat. Okay. Let me see. You said you were able to parlay your consultancy into an in-house lawyer position. What was the licensing process for that like in the Netherlands? Um, I work for a multinational corporation. Um, so our general counsel is actually in the US as is a, a good portion of our legal team. Um, and even though the parent company is headquartered in the Netherlands, we are in various places. So I am working for my company um, and, you know, it, it, it has not been an issue thus far. Yeah. Great. So um, I'm not practicing Dutch law. I'm, I'm yeah. looking at privacy law right, everywhere and, and contracts. Yeah. Broadly. Yeah. Um, yeah. We have a comment from Jeff Spofford who says, eat Stroop waffles. I hope that <laughs> is something you've had. It's hard to say. Stroop waffles are delicious, I have to say. It's um, it's a sort of a cookie. Um, it's it's a, if you think of a wafer, but like yes. with fresh dough wafer, um, and in the middle is caramel, which I love caramel. Yeah. And uh, so yeah, the Dutch are known for stroop waffles. I will say cuisine here is not my favorite cuisine, but the stroop waffles rock. They're great. You're making me <laughs> yeah. hungry. 
Um, we have a, another, um, I guess it's a question. You said there were certain other places you considered that weren't as well suited. Could you share those? Um, sure. So I love Paris. It's a beautiful city. It's the city I have visited more than any other. Um, yeah, I, I believe more than any other. Maybe Monterey or San Francisco because I lived out there and I used to go out there regularly uh, for the jazz festival. So I may have been there more than Paris, but you know, it's, it's neck and neck. Um, and there are multinational corporations um, in, in Paris. Um, by and large, they, at least at the time that I was looking, were more catering in to, to the, the French market versus looking to the rest of the world, right? So if there is a multinational there, it's there for the French market, not necessarily looking outward. Um, so that's one of the places, the other place that I love and really, um, uh, was very interested in, in going to is Berlin. Um, I, Berlin is just also a great city and one that I have a real affinity, um, with, however, um, for my line of work, Berlin at that time is not really the place. Um, it's kind of a startup capital. It's um, really known as artistic and, and cutting edge. It's changing a little bit, but, but that's what, we're, and startups, we're not paying for privacy work, okay? That just was not happening. And um, so those were two of the big things. Um, and as I said, the, the infrastructure here for expats is amazing. I'll give you a little example. Um, on my month exploration, right, in March of 2017, I guess, I spent um, a month going to these four different cities. I also went to Brussels and um, it's the head of the EU, that's where regulation is, but, but that was not gonna be the place for me. Um, but I walked into, um, what was then called the expat center here in Amsterdam. And just to ask some questions, I found this thing online and just wanted to know. And, you know, and I said, yeah, well, I was looking and wanted more information and possibly moving here. And the woman said, well, is this for you? And I said, yes. And I said, well, you know, but I'm a lawyer. And I got a hard bound book that I have. Um, your first 30 days, she gave this to me. She started circling the agencies I could look at and then she said, oh, do you want to talk to your immigration person? And I went and I spoke to the person at immigration who started giving me wow. tips and telling me, okay, you're an American. Here's how you can come. You can do this. You can do this. I've been in the country 48 hours. So right. Awesome. And I was, yeah. Um, so I looked for similar places um, elsewhere and they may be there, but I didn't find them. Um, wow. So it was just, that's what I mean about you know, it was meant to be. Almost, yeah, it was meant to yeah. be. So Juliana Spafford, who is uh, my Dutch buddy, is going Hi. to interact. Maybe she'll Hi. say something in Dutch for us. What do you want to say? Hi again for you that you in Nederland won't. <laughs> so uh, yeah. basically, I don't have so much of a question as more a comment to say. Good for you. Good, good bravery, amazing, amazing step that you took to do this. Um, and everything that you said resonated so much with me. Um, my father was Dutch, my mother was American, and she okay. was half Puerto Rican from this Bronx, New York, by the oh, way. Oh, wow, okay. Um, and, you know, we lived in the Netherlands from the time that I was five to 18. When I came here to go to college, I went to all Dutch schools. I'm still fluent in Dutch. Okay. Um, but a lot of the things that you said really resonated with me because my mom was an American citizen in the U in the Netherlands at the time. And in the 70s, there weren't as many things that she could, you know, rely on to help the expats. But the one thing that 
did help her a lot and that she was very involved in was the American Women's Club that's based in Amsterdam. I grew up in yeah. Hilversum. I don't know if you yes. know that yes. it's know close, to, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. close to Utrecht. We call it the Hollywood of, of Holland because yes. that's where all the yes. it's where all the television and movies are made, the Dutch, the Dutch language television yeah. and movies. Um, and also the other thing that I have in common with you is that I am a privacy lawyer as well. So um, <gasps> So please yeah. reach out to me and I Absolutely. work in house. I'm general okay. counsel and chief privacy officer for, right now for a small startup, but I was at Dun & Bradstreet. So I've done the okay. multinational and I have to tell you, it's a bit of a bit of a breath of fresh air to now be in a U.S. company again because <laughs> we have a lot more gray areas that we can deal with with just U.S. law, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So um, I do. Yeah, but. I, I find it, we definitely have to connect first of all where are you like located physically i'm in the boston area i'm in the boston okay. area okay. so so we will connect um and yeah i definitely need work with dutch as you can see um but it's yeah more things in common than than imagine for those of you who don't know my mother is puerto rican so that's why we have that in common um my father was european um, but but okay. my mother was Puerto Rican, and they they met in New York City, and and you know that's, so did that's mine. Great. So did mine. Yeah, yeah. So that's, so that's yes, where we'll it get all in touch. Is. But um, it's great to meet you, and I think it's Likewise. wonderful what you're doing. So thank you. Keep thank keep you. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, does anyone else have a question? Let's see. I have Dina, Dina saying, I've done some work on discrimination against people of color and multilingual children in the Dutch territories in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. How has this been for you? Um, for me, it's been fine, actually. You're talking about the Dutch territories. So I'm in, you know, I'm in the mothership, right? So that's that's one thing. Um, I, I have to say that it took me maybe six months of being here before I realized that I didn't, feel as I as if I were a suspect, which is how I have lived my whole life in the US. Um, walking hard, into any store. Hard it's hard to hear, but it's it's true. And really? Dina asked the question and, and Dina, yeah. you know, she doesn't do fluff. Oh, so I know. Um, it's it's it, but, but that's just the, that's the reality, right? That's just yeah. the way it is. And um, it's it's really something to um, realize you know you know it you experience it it's there but to realize how much of that i have walked around with my whole life yeah. and that's not to say that there isn't racism and other stuff in the netherlands it's to say that me and my person um i was amazed to like get that no people are not following me around the store thinking i'm going to take something Right. And that that was just kind of a, a revelation. Um, you know, I have not experienced the, the type of discrimination that I am aware is experienced by other people. Mm -hmm. um, and I have um, a friend here who, who's Dutch and she has lived abroad and, and um, has been very sympathetic to my expat plight and extremely helpful. Um, and we've had many of these conversations and, and she um, said to me that I, as an American, you know, whatever that's supposed to be, because in America, I'm always asked, where are you from, um, that uh, I would never experience the kind of racism that some of the other people do. Um, that is something that was conveyed to me. I have not experienced it um, in the same way that I do in the place where I was born. Right. Well, that, I mean, I'm happy for you over there then. And then it's just so devastating to hear, you know, how it is in the United States and in New York, which we all know. Um, yeah. But I'm happy that you feel lighter. Yes. You know? Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Me too. Um, me too. Another person asked if you are in touch with any Northeastern law grads there, and if there's any kind of uh, European expat alumni group, which I'm not aware that there is, but maybe we can start one after zooming out. 
I would love Larry. to be involved. Um, as, as you know, I'm an NUSL fan. So if there's an opportunity for that, yes. I'm not aware of any Northeastern grads here. I am still in touch with, you know, several, you know, graduates and, you know, um, but they're all over there, not, not here. Um, interesting tidbit. And since you brought this up as one of the fun facts um, that I went to, you know, music and art, um, the, the fame school, one of my high school classmates lives nearby, which is just like nuts. Um, I, I found that out inadvertently and I thought, is this a typo? Like this is, this guy's from my high school, like, what we, you know, and we've been in touch since high school, right? You know, I, yeah. I've seen him at various things and reunions and I reached out to him and said, oh yeah, no, I've been living in Leiden, you know, for three years. And I was like, well, I live in Amsterdam. So that's kind of fun. And, and he's, put me in touch with other people from music and art who are living um, in Europe. So um, that that's kind of fun. So I can start a music and art alumni yeah, <laughs> situation. But, um, if you find them or know where they are, I'm happy to, you know, help. Right. With that. We'll do. Does anybody else have a question? Um, my funny friend, Jeff, who's married to Juliana said, I can help with your Dutch. I've been married 30 years to Juliana and I know five Dutch words. <laughs> <laughs> uh -oh. so I don't think there's something we should probably say on this. Uh... <laughs> it must be a hard language. It, it is um, a, a, a difficult language. So my uh, here in Lyon would be happy to connect. Hi, whoever that is, it's to iPhone. It's iPhone to everyone. So whoever okay. just wrote that in the chat, we need your name. And, and that's um, Lisa Roberts, who's going to be one of our interviewees. Yeah. Woohoo! Yes. Okay. Je pense que tu peux de français et nous pouvons le pratiquer. Je parle français, un petit peu. But I would just echo all the things you said about the bank accounts and the labels. And last night I, I had to call 911 for nothing really serious, but I realized I don't know how to communicate what, you know, I want to communicate, so. Yes. Yeah, that is one thing that uh, I am really grateful for is that just about everything, everyone, at least in Amsterdam, not necessarily in other parts of the country, but in Amsterdam, everybody does speak English and does make an effort to communicate with you. But 911 is not 911 in every country. And I always forget no. what it is here. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, something I need to know. But, yeah. I have another question. Lisa, are you, did you have yes, another question? Yes, done. Done. Okay. done. Nope. I want to make sure. Um, from Justin Connor, Justin, you could um, unmute yourself and ask it if you would like to, or I can read it. Sure, um, sure happy to. Hey, Maya, um, just hi. wanted to ask you about LGBT pride in the Netherlands and what you think of that, if it's kind of like very corporate, sort of the way it is in the US, or does it still have a kind of cultural change um, dimension to it there? Um, I, there, there is both, I really found it to be, um, I don't know if you were on when the, I had the photos up of yes. Pride. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it, to me, it was a fun family event and a festivity, right? More than I anticipate. I mean, look, Pride in New York is a lot of fun, but, but there's, you know, like a political slant, it's gotten more corporate, etc. This was just fun. This was a time for people to party. Um, there were corporate sponsors. Um, I, I'll tell you, so I, I do really see it. I'm, I'm straight, you know, as they say, straight, but not narrow. So I'm not in deep enmeshed in, in the community. But from my perspective as an outsider, there's no, I see things being very welcoming. I mean, I see couples of all ages, all types walking around, um, you know, holding hands, being affectionate and nobody blinks. So um, I, I don't think that that's just um, talk. I think it's, it's real. That's what I've experienced it in the way that I can experience it. Um, one thing that I will say that was kind of fun, um, the, the pride, a parade that I attended here was in 2019, which happened to be the 50th anniversary of Stonewall. And what really amazed me is that there were all these tributes to Stonewall. And I realized, yeah, you know, this, this, I mean, I used to live a few streets down, right? Uh, so I was like, wow, okay. From the actual Stonewall Inn, I lived on 9th Street. Um, 
in New York. So that was kind of fun. The last thing we have probably less than a minute um, that I'd like to say is that I, it was probably clear, but Amsterdam is known as a party city. People think of Amsterdam and they can come here and get high and, you know, it, it has that, but it's so much more than that. It's, it's really a cultural city. It's an historic city. Um, in my experience as still a sort of an outsider because I don't speak Dutch yet. Um, it is a tolerant city. Um, and so I think if I can leave anybody with anything is that um, reimagine your thoughts of Amsterdam as a place to go and you know have a good time. You can and you can do much more. Thank you, Maya. I think that's a beautiful place to end it, saying that there's so much more than just kind of the typical um, Amsterdam and there's a lot to it and you've really taken us on a journey. Um, we've had some great information in the chat if you all wanna take a look at that before you um, exit today's program, but I couldn't think of a person I'd rather do this first journey with than you. Thanks for sharing Thank your world you. and your life and your work with us. I really, really value that. And it's so good to see Thank you. you. Um, uh, I totally enjoyed it. And Dina, I've just been seeing your emails and we should probably have another chat because that's all true. And it's, it's worth a conversation, but unfortunately didn't get into it here. Um, but uh, will, thank you so I will much. I email for you. Got great. Let's, let's hey, do thank that. You. Um, Thank you, Miel. Um, yeah, Maya, I'll put you in touch with me. Juliana. Thank you, everybody, for joining today. The next one that we will have is uh, September 24th. If you'd like to join and um, create our own expat community together through these Zooming outs, please do. That will be Canberra, Australia. I hope I'm saying that right. I'm going to learn. Um, <laughs> and Maya, take really good care. And I will stay in touch. And I hope you do the same. And thanks, everybody, for joining today. Thanks, everybody. Bye.